Hi there, this is Thiru, author of Bitbee and welcome back to the channel. Today we are into the episode number 4 of our Java Dev interview series and today I am taking you through the questions asked at SAP Labs for 3 plus years of experience. Let's start with the questions without making any further delay. Before diving into the video, please subscribe to the channel if you are not yet subscribed. Also please share the channel with your friends. So the first question is from Core Java and the question is how the hashing works internally in HashMap. We all know that in Java map or hash map stores the data in the form of key value pairs. This key value pairs we called also known as entries, right? But if we go little deep into how these entries stored in the map, they were not stored directly in the same form in map, but actually they reside in some other data structures like linked lists or a balanced trees. Again, these data structures were mapped or allocated to the segments called buckets in the map. So whenever we define a map or hash map in Java, initially map will be divided into number of buckets and they were numbered or indexed from 0 to 15 or you can also say initial capacity of the map is 16. Again, this initial capacity or number of buckets count will get increased or gets doubled when the number of entries into the buckets reach threshold called load factor and the load factor is 75% for maps. So coming back to the storing entry inside a bucket, a bucket can have one or more number of entries in the form of linked list. I will tell you when the balance tree will come into the picture in a while but for now we'll take an example of linked list for our understanding. So to find the respective bucket number to store an entry, the process called hashing is applied. Also you might have heard about hash code method in Java which is defined in the object class. So all Java objects inherit this method by default. This hash code method returns an integer value that represents an object's hash code. Usually hash code is generated from the object's content and memory address. The main objective of doing this process of generating hash code or hashing is to search and retrieve objects in constant time or at max within linear time complexity. In our case, while adding an entry to the map, the key from the entry will be hashed to generate an hash code. Usually, it is recommended to implement our own hash code method for our custom objects in Java so we can generate an unique hash code for each entry. So this will help in avoiding hash collisions. I will tell you in a while why we need to avoid these hash collisions. After generating an integer hash code, usually this integer number is modulo divided by the current size of the map and this resultant number will determine the bucket number in which the entry should be stored. Let's take some example to understand this hashing mechanism. Suppose you have three entries Steve, Mark and Elon with values Apple, Meta, X. Let's assume they have hash codes generated are 34, 33 and 30. Then the bucket number will be determined by dividing them with 16. Now if one more entry is coming and we have to store it in the map, again the same process is followed. Suppose this new entry is bill and value is Microsoft. Now if this entry also have the hash code 34 which is same as Steve, then we will get the same bucket number to store where Steve is stored, right? This is the scenario of hash collision and in this case hash map internally stores the multiple entries in the linked list. When we search for a key or entry in the map, the bucket number will be determined and then again it searches the exact key in the linked list. So now clearly in case of same bucket, the time complexity for searching operation can increase from O of 1 to O of N. Right? This is why we always avoid hash collisions in case of more number of entries. There were several techniques or algorithms were followed to avoid hash collisions known as hash collision techniques. You can explore on this topic further if you want. So following is the summary or key points to remember for the hashing and hash map in Java. Number one is efficient hashing and implementation of hash code and equals method. Note it here, equals method should be implemented properly to compare the keys of an entries which we use generally for hashing searching and crucial for performance. Also for storing entries in buckets, before Java 8 HashMap is using a linked list but from Java 8 onwards it is using red black tree or we can say balanced tree. Compared to linked list, red black tree will have time complexity to search a key is O of log n which is better than O of n, right? Also this balanced tree will have capability to sort and arrange the entries within them by hash codes. Now let's move to the next question and this question is on again on Java HashMap along with Stream API. The question is sort the HashMap according to the keys and use Stream API for sorting. The intention of this question is interviewer wants you to create your own custom class and put that entries into the map and then sort it further. 
To achieve this, you have to override and implement your own hash code and equals methods for keys comparison and sorting. So let's jump into the example to demo it. First we'll start with creating a custom class for example a employee class here. Let's say there were two fields in the class that is id and name. Usually ids are unique right? Then let's declare a constructor taking id and name as parameters. Then we'll have the getter methods for both the fields. Next we'll override and implement the hash code method using employee id which is recommended right? In similar fashion, we'll override the equals method. If two objects are same by reference, then no need to comparing the content and we'll return true. Next, if provided object is null or both objects are from different class instances, then we'll return false, right? Else finally, we will compare both the employee IDs are same, then we have to return true. Also overriding here to string method for purpose of printing objects content, you can pause and take a note of this code. A small mistake and correction from my side, actually there is a typo, I used id and employee id field names, so you only keep any one of them for your reference. Now let's try to implement the utility method to create a map with employee entries and then we'll sort the map using stream api. Creating a map which will take employee object as a key which will contains id and name, then it will take a department name as value for that object. Next we'll put some entries to the map, we'll put the entries in random order of the employee IDs. Now let's just print all the entries or key values before sorting the map using for each. Now here is the main part, we'll put a stream over the entry set from the map and then for each entry we'll use sorted method. For sorted method we can pass a lambda expression for compare to method which is from comparator class for object comparison. If you have no idea on this comparator class I recommend you to explore on that topic so that you will be well aware of what is default or natural sorting and how sorting works for this kind of custom objects. Once the objects got sorted in stream according to our keys, then we'll collect and map them to a new linked hash map which will preserve the sorting order of the entries inside stream, right? This is what I did here after collecting the sorted entries. Finally, let's print the new sorted map and when we execute our code, you will see the output as following. You can observe in the output that initially the entries in map are not sorted as we inserted. After sorting using stream API and comparator, you can see the entries were get sorted according to the employee IDs, right? This is all about how we can sort the data inside a map, it's simple, right? Now let's move to the next one. This question is from design patterns and the question is give an example for singleton design pattern, how can we achieve or implement it and also how can we break that? So if you see the behavior of the singleton pattern is it ensures that a class has only one instance and provides a global access point to that instance. Which means whenever you try to create an object for a singleton class it always ensures that it will return you the same single and already instantiated object. Here I am showing you a sample example how can we declare and create singleton class as per its definition. I have declared a class called singleton then declared same class field inside I also made the field as static so that during class load only we can instantiate this field. Next we'll make the default constructor as private so that it is not accessible directly to create an object using new keyword and default constructor right. To initialize and access the singleton object, we'll declare public static getter method for that field which is accessible globally. Then inside the getter method, we'll check if the instance is not yet initialized. We'll initialize it using default constructor which is only available to the same class. This is one of the simple type of singleton, usually it's not a thread safe in multi-threaded environment. Also we can break it using reflection or by cloning. So next we'll see in different ways how can we break singleton class behavior. But for reference you should know this simple implementation for singleton class, ok? To make our singleton class thread safe, we can declare the getter method as synchronized. So even though multiple threads try to access it, only one thread is allowed at a time and we can prevent duplication of initializing the singleton object, right? There is also another way to define a singleton class using a static inner class and this is called as billpog singleton class. Here static inner class is responsible for holding the singleton instance. 
Now let's see how can we break the singleton behavior in various ways as asked by the interviewer. So as I told you earlier, we can break the singleton behavior of a class using reflection API and we can achieve it by accessing its private constructor. So I'm just showing the code here to break it using reflection. Assume we have sample singleton class and then using reflection, we can get its constructor as singleton.class.getDeclared constructor. Then we can set the constructor accessible using constructor.set accessible to true. And finally, to create the instance of singleton, we can use constructor.new instance, which creates a new instance each time for that singleton class. This is how simply we can break the singleton class using reflection. So now when we try to print the hash codes, they will print two different hash codes since they are two different objects, right? Now let's see how we can break the singleton using second way that is using serialization. Suppose if any singleton class extends serializable class, then during deserialization process, it will always create a new instance every time. So for this, here is the example where singleton class extended the serializable class and during deserialization, you can see each time it gives us a new instance. Next, there is one more way to break the singletons in case if they implement clonable interface. Breaking the singleton behavior is simple here. We can clone and create a new instance from the singleton instance. I'm showing the same thing here. After deserialization, we have one instance created. Then using instance clone method, we are able to create other instance. If we check the hash codes of these two, it will print different hash codes like in our previous examples. I hope you got it now. And there is also one more way we can break the singleton behavior that is using multi-threading. I have already explained you this. If the global accessible getter method is not thread safe, then we can still break it with multi-threads. You can just take a note of this example too. So overall, whenever singleton design pattern interview question is on your table, make sure you have all these ways of creation and breaking of singletons. Interviewer can ask from any topic on this. So just summarizing here, the preventions necessary to avoid breaking the behavior of singleton class for which it is meant for right. Please go through or take the note of these points and I don't want to take much of your time on this. Now let's move to the next question. The question is what is functional interface and name some predefined functional interfaces. So this is from Java 8 and let's answer this. A functional interface in Java is an interface that contains exactly one abstract method. It may contain other non-abstract methods, but remember always there is only one single abstract method in functional interface. Functional interfaces are very handy to pass those abstract methods as lambda expressions for less and readable code. These interfaces were introduced in Java 8 which are annotated with at the rate functional interface. We can also create our functional interface using the annotation and here is the sample functional interface named calculator. Inside I declared a single method which is by default abstract so the interface is functional interface now. You can also see I have just created the instance of that functional interface just by passing those required params as lambda expressions, right? Yeah, it looks like magic, but that is how powerful these interfaces are. Now on that method, I can perform whichever operations we want. Here I am listing out some of the predefined functional interfaces with examples. You can take a note of them. Let's move to the next question and this question is from SQL. Question is, write a SQL query to find the employee whose role is manager and his joining date is in month of April. If you are well aware with SQL queries, this is very straightforward to write. So the query you can write like a select a star from employees where job title is manager and joining date is month of joining date equal to 4. 
here we are just using two SQL functions one is to lower the job title value in table so that it can match with our search parameter second one is the month function to extract out the month number from joining date column that's it moving to the next question this is from SQL comments question is explain the difference between delete and truncate so there are many differences between delete and truncate commands I listed out most of them here and you can take a note of them the most important differences are delete is a dml or data manipulation command and truncate is ddl command delete command deletes only some data based on where condition where s truncate removes all the data or rows from the table delete command can be rolled back within a transaction where s truncate cannot be rolled back moving to the next question this is from sql comments question is explain the difference between delete and truncate so there are many differences between delete and truncate commands i listed out most of them here and you can take a note of them the most important differences are delete is a dml or data manipulation command and truncate is ddl command delete command deletes only some data based on where condition where s truncate removes all the data or rows from the table delete command can be rolled back within a transaction where s truncate cannot be rolled back moving to the final question question is how the spring boot application starts so here you need to answer what and all steps are performed by spring boot during application start okay so during the spring boot application startup it performs some required steps i am listing out the steps here starting from the run method which is invoked from main method from the main application class next is initialization of application context usually with annotations used such as annotation config application context or web application context environment props also loaded during this phase from config files then next is component scan and bean loading phase where it looks up the spring annotations such as at the rate component at the rate controller or at the rate service etc next in the fourth phase it will init the beans and does the dependency injection and in the final phase it will start the embedded or configured server also starts the events and listeners with full application start so those are the all necessary actions spring boot performs during the start of the application so that is all about in this episode guys i hope you found this QA is helpful please comment your thoughts and feedback in the comment section and don't forget to hit the bell icon and we'll see you in the next episode